I started rolling out some emotional intelligence training and I could certainly see some of the faces in the audience. I could see the look on their face and it looked like, why have you pulled me off site to talk to me about feelings for two hours? I could, it was almost deer in headlights looking at me like, what am I doing here? Because when you're talking about emotional intelligence, you do have to self-reflect, you do have to ask yourself some hard questions about how to lead with emotional intelligence, as well as from our staff around building their own self-awareness and reading other people. Welcome to the Manage Self, Lead Others Leadership Podcast with Nina Sunday for experienced and aspiring people managers. This show helps you explore ways to become a more intentional leader. Each episode, host Nina Sunday speaks with some of the brightest business minds on the planet who share a passion to elevate and transform team culture. Workplace culture hides in plain sight. Is yours flourishing? Join the movement to make your workplace a better place to work. Are you ready? Because it's time to manage self, lead others. Alice Hanna is People and Culture Manager at Capital Group and won Australian HR Awards HR Manager of the Year 2022 for transforming recruitment and onboarding and Capital's innovative graduate program. Capital Group is a Melbourne, Australia construction company named number one best place to work in Australia 2022 in recognition of its genuine commitment to transform the construction industry for the better. Welcome, Alice Hanna. Thank you so much for having me, Nina. Well, congratulations on your award, HR Manager of the Year 2022. Well, please tell us, uh, tell us about what that award means to you and what you had to do to win it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's um, quite humbling, actually. I get quite shy about awards. Um, so um, our marketing team actually chose some categories to, to enter some of our people in this year. And um, lucky me, I got chosen to be nominated. And it was a, a submission from our marketing team, which really summarised all of the initiatives that myself and my team have implemented across the last year to work on our culture, um, attraction, retention, leadership, um, changing the construction industry. So they wrote up quite a few initiatives that myself and the team have done and, um, you know, really honoured to have been chosen as the HR Manager of the Year. Well, it's it's uh, quite an accolade and well done. Thank you. Um, some of the things I read that you have done was introducing a leadership philosophy and leadership mm. development program. Mm. Tell me about leadership philosophy. That's a wonderful word. Thank you. Yeah, look, I mean, every organisation has a vision statement, a mission statement, a value statement, but we actually have a leadership philosophy as well, which is almost what I call almost the Ten Commandments of Leadership, that we have stated out um, how we want our leaders to operate, the mindset we want them to have, the approach we want them to have to leadership. So there are things in there like be humble be the leader you craved, um, work on the team more than in the team. So there are sort of 10 um, areas of leadership mindset that we want them to um, live and breathe every day. So we're not telling leaders how to lead. Each leader has their own style, but we want them to lead in line with our leadership philosophy. So we train all of our new leaders on that and it's something we touch base with them on quite regularly to make sure that they're living and breathing that to give people a really consistent experience of leadership across the business. I think I think you've hit the nail on the head, Alice, because uh, I, I recently attended a live Jim Collins who wrote Good to Great. Oh, I love that book. <laughs> well, he's, he's revised it and also he's definitely uh, still doing his research and work and he really put down that one of the there are two um, key attributes of a good leader and one key attribute is humility okay. having the humility of the truly great is is a phrase I've heard so how does that play out in the workplace how does a leader express humility with without being too self self-effacing Look, I think in terms of behaviours, it's things like shouting your team's achievements from the rooftops, not your own. Um, so it's small little tweaks to how you word things and how you give credit and how you operate day to day. And it's not me, me, me. It's us, 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 we, we, we. So I think um, it, it's 
a lot of this stuff is not really tangible, but it's really small tweaks to how leaders think and talk and operate that's more collective and a leader they're seeing themselves as serving the team, not the important person out the front, but the person who's actually there underneath supporting the team. That's wonderful because it's language, it's nuances, it's it's not having your ego so overblown that it has to be look at me. It's being generous of spirit enough to be able to give credit where credit is due and never ever taking credit for someone else's idea without acknowledge or without acknowledging it or giving them the credit. <laughs> Absolutely. So it sounds like that might be a thing of the past in your team but, uh, but people <laughs> tell me people tell me it's definitely not a thing of the past yet so that's one of the things we want to uh uh transform in the workplace mm. um you what caught my attention was uh an hr magazine's uh article saying uh they when i told them uh or they they thought I, I they thought I was an alien when I was going to do emotional intelligence training with them. So can t- tell us that story. <laughs> Sure. So look, the construction industry is quite a a technical industry. There's a lot to know about how to build, but then there's the safety standards, the compliance standards, the, you know, regulations, the law. So a lot of training in this industry is around building things right, building things safely. So traditionally, and this is changing, but traditionally training and development hasn't been around topics like emotional intelligence. And I think feelings is a topic that the industry tries to shy away from but that's not the world we live in anymore. So I started rolling out some emotional intelligence training and I could certainly see some of the faces in the audience. I could see the look on their face. Um, it looked like, why have you pulled me off site to talk to me about feelings for two hours? I could. It was almost deer in headlights looking at me like, what am I doing here? But to everybody's credit, everybody so far, we're still rolling it out, has really been engaged in the topic, has felt vulnerable enough to be open and share uh, because when you're talking about emotional intelligence, you do have to self-reflect. You do have to ask yourself some hard questions. So everybody so far has been great and there's been some really great feedback on that topic, both from the leadership version we run, so how to lead with emotional intelligence, as well as from um, our staff around building their own self-awareness and reading other people and still a year since the first one I ran with our graduates, they still refer to it when they're talking to me, which I think is fantastic. What's the one body language a piece of advice you give leaders when they're communicating with their teams that they might not be aware of? Or have you ever had to give feedback to someone that their body language was saying something different to the message they were trying to communicate? Oh, picking one is so hard, Nina. Um, I really encourage leaders to start observing their own body language, but also to read the body language of who's in the room with them to help them tailor the conversation. So I've certainly sat in meetings where the the person starts doing, you know, really defensive body language moves, and I've had to back the leader off. I remember once sitting in a a warning meeting, unfortunately, a performance warning meeting, and the person clearly was feeling very attacked almost. Um, So I really had to back the leader off and take a break from the meeting. And the leader had no idea what was going on. They were, you know, why are we taking a break? What's going on here? And I had to say, didn't you notice the body language of the person in the room? So that's obviously an extreme case, but I do always encourage our leaders to just practice in every meeting reading the room so that when they are in those more um, important or difficult conversations, they have those skills to understand the other person. And that doesn't just go for things like warnings. It could be negotiating negotiating meetings or trying to win business with new customers. Body language tells you so much. So just starting to observe yourself, other people, and how other people react to your body language is so important. One of the other things around leadership too that I wouldn't mind your opinion on is doing one-on-ones, making not just having team meetings, but having one-on-one meetings that are not just a performance review. Have you got any uh, policies or procedures on that or advice on that? 
We ask our managers to catch up with every person at least once a month to talk not about work, (laughs) as in not about the project, not about the to-do list, not about the current week, but to talk how are you, how are you feeling, to refer back perhaps to a performance review that was held a couple of months beforehand. So we really encourage our leaders to have those conversations. And often leaders say, yeah, I speak to them every day. And I say, but when did you last speak to them not about what was on their plate for the project? And they think, oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, I asked them how their weekend was. And I say, no, no, no. When when was the last time you had a real conversation with them? So we do encourage, it's not a policy or a rule, but we encourage our leaders to catch up with every person one-on-one at least once a month to have that non-task list-based conversation with people. Interesting, interesting. And it would, how long would it be? About 20 minutes? Is that all it needs to be? I guess it really depends on what's happening with the person. Some Mm. people will be like, yeah, everything's great. And other people will say, well, thank you for asking. I've actually got this on my mind. So I don't, leaders don't need to book an hour out with every person every month. That's just not feasible. But I really encourage leaders to have those conversations, sometimes informally, sometimes take the person for a coffee if they notice the person might like to talk. So again, it's not a policy. There's no template. It's just encouraging managers to have those conversations so that it's not only once a quarter, which is our performance management cycle, that a person speaks to their manager about themselves, their career, how they're feeling and not their to-do list. Exactly, because one of the things is is uh, understanding where they hope to be in a year's time or five years' time. So do you encourage them to have those uh, career career conversations? Yeah, definitely. And our performance review cycle, as I said, is quarterly. And one of the quarters focuses solely on career development. There's no performance conversation. There's no performance feedback. There's no goal setting. There's no checking in on KPIs. Once a year, it's an hour long conversation about career development. Um, How are you using your strengths currently? Where do you want to use them in the future? What's the next step for you? What's the gap for you to get there? So it's quite a detailed, deep dive into career development in the organisation. And we do that on purpose so it's not a five-minute chunk within an hour-long performance review once a year because then you are spending five minutes talking about your career in a year. So, as I said, one of our quarterly catch-ups is um, 100% focused on career development, which is so important. We've only recently rolled that out, actually, and I think the first round went really, really well. We've got some great feedback from people that appreciated that dedicated time to talk about their development and their future rather than here's how you went in the last three months and here's where you can improve and you missed your KPIs by 10% and all of that. You don't need to have that conversation four times a year. Smart, successful people know how they're performing. Yes, yes. And of course, that's where you might spot some uh, uh, potential leaders in conversations like that. Isn't that right? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I would hope we are spotting potential leaders day in, day out with how they operate, how they interact with everybody else, um, not just their performance, but their demeanour. I would hope that we are keeping an eye out for that every day, um, not once a year in a performance review. But yes, absolutely. Um, I think those chats are great because we might assume where someone might want want to end up or think their skill set leads them down an obvious path. But without actually asking them, we don't know what they want to do. And sometimes those conversations are surprising. We had somebody in the last round that we thought was going to want to go down the project management path that turned around and said they wanted to do something very different that we wouldn't have known if we hadn't asked. Exactly. That's a wonderful thing. One of the uh, things noted that contributed to your winning the HR Manager of the Year Award was that you facilitated a graduate retreat and a project coordinator retreat Mm. uh, as part of your development, uh, uh, learning and development programs. Tell us about that, please. Sure. Well, we've got about 25 grads in our organisation. And while they do a lot of training and learning, we really wanted to give them a really fantastic intensive learning experience, but also time to bond with each other and the directors and senior leaders of our business. Often graduates don't get to do that. So we all went away to a winery for three days, which was great. And we did a lot of technical training, interpersonal skills training. Uh, We did, um, you know, we had some fun. And also they spent a lot of time 
time um, in small groups and one-on-one with members of our executive team, which is an opportunity graduates don't often get. And they just, they loved it. They lapped it up. They had stars in their eyes. Um, It was really, really, really fantastic uh, to the extent that we then decided to roll it out with another role in our business, which is called a project coordinator. So we ran a similar retreat, different topics and different level of training, of course, uh, because uh, once you're away from the workplace and really focus for more than a half day training session, uh, you really open up more, you learn more, you forget about work, you don't have it rolling in your head. So having that three-day offsite and allowing our graduates to bond with everybody right up to the owners of the business was quite unique, I think, and quite a good opportunity for them. Mm. And of course, you're a woman in the construction industry. I am. One of the initiatives you did was um, a school's talk program to attract girls to study construction and Mm. uh, and trades. Tell Mm. us about that. That sounds fabulous. Well, look, I went to a girls' school and they didn't once say the word construction in the entire 12 years I was there. It was not even on my radar, but here I am in the industry and I think it's a fantastic industry. So I think it's just not put on the table for girls so they don't necessarily think it's an option for them. The media portray construction as men hauling heavy things in high-vis vests, and that's maybe 5% of the industry. It's such a vibrant industry where no matter your passion and skill set, there's a role in the industry. So, you know, once people have already got to uni, it's too late. They've chosen what they want to do. So to attract women to the industry, you have to start a lot younger. So we've been connecting with schools. I think we've done maybe five or six this year um, to just put it on the table. We're not saying they must study construction. We're saying, hey, here's aspects of the industry you might not have thought of. Here's what the industry is really like. Here are some of the opportunities you might not think sit under the banner of construction, just to get them starting to think. And even if they don't end up in construction, it may get them thinking, oh, what else is out there that I actually didn't know about or had a different view about or, um, you know, was aligning to the stereotype about. So it's really just helping to take those blinkers off, I think. So what qualification or what faculty does that come under to to study construction? Well, it depends on um, the area of the industry you want to go into. There's tertiary-wise, there's architecture, there's construction management, there's project management, there's quantity surveying. Then from a trade perspective, obviously, there are apprenticeships around electrician, plumbing, all of those sort of trades. So there's an absolute bunch (laughs) that sit under the, the broad remit of construction. Yeah, and 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 girls now can really think about uh, more options in terms of their their career because uh, mm. yeah, so that's a wonderful thing. And um, okay, your company was also named. Uh, what was it number one best place to work in Australia this year, twenty twenty two? Tell us what what it, is it about the Capital Group, which is based in Melbourne? What are they doing that make it a number one best place to work? Great question. Uh, Certainly not just one thing. Um, Look, we have a vision to really change the industry, break the mould, do things differently. And I think starting with that authentic drive really um, opens so many doors when it comes to culture. So we never just want to prescribe to how the industry's always done it. And that means we hire really innovative people and we ask them to do really innovative things. But one of the things we do really well is we authentically ask for a lot of feedback and then we actually action it, which doesn't sound like rocket science, but so many companies don't do that. So we have so many different ways and forums to give feedback and then we track it really, really in a lot of detail. And then I'm a bit of a dog with a bone like this. I just run feedback to the ground and make sure we action even very small things because we understand that cumulatively very small changes will add up to really fantastic changes. So the first time we entered the Work Plus study, we came 24th, which was really exciting for us. And what we did was we took every single bit of feedback. And while we can't action at all, we communicated back really regularly. We prioritised what people saw as the most important feedback. No piece of feedback was too small. And we really actioned the vast majority of the feedback. And then it just showed the the next year we came number one. And I think part of that was people see, oh, wow, they listen. They actually care what I have to say. And they actually do something about it, even if it's something quite small. So I think that's one of the reasons. And also, we just are really authentic about wanting to move the needle with gender. 
uh, work-life balance and uh, innovation, which are three areas that the construction industry is well behind on. And I think our people see it's authentic and not lip service. Okay, so when you say the construction industry is a bit behind in innovation, mm. that's because people are doing what they've always done instead of looking for better ways to do things. They sort of become a bit complacent about how things are done. Is that it? or A little bit, I think. Um I certainly came from 20 years in the software industry, which is really experimental and really embracing of change. And I found that the construction industry is not. That might be because it's such a safety focused industry. Trying new things comes with an inherent risk. So I think there's a general mentality in the industry of when you've got something that works and is safe, don't change it. Um, And it's also a very time pressured industry. So experimenting and trying new things comes with risk of things not working and um, impacts on time and profit and all of those things. So it's certainly something I've found in my four or five years in construction is that experimentation and innovation isn't as embraced as other industries. So we're really trying to change that and try new things and break the mould. You've you've got uh, initiatives to improve retention of the staff you have, as well as attracting new people. Uh, tell us a bit about your attraction and retention uh, strategies, if, the, if they're not um, top secret. <laughs> no, not at all. Look, I think we're just really authentic when we hire. So people know what they're going to get. And because we are trying to change the industry, people are attracted to that. So the hours in the construction industry in Australia are awful. Burnout is rife. Mental health issues are rife. Mm -hmm. So we work really, really hard on work-life balance initiatives. And that attracts a lot of people to us without us even trying. We just talk about it on social media and podcasts and job ads and people come to us because it is different. Uh, In terms of retention, again, I think it's really listening to people people again. We we don't just send out a culture survey once a year. We ask things like, hey, what processes are really inefficient? What's your biggest bugbear? What's your biggest frustrator on a day-to-day basis? What's inefficient? What work do you do that you don't think you should be doing? And we collate all of this in what we call process and efficiency sessions, which is really aimed at making people's working day smoother, more efficient, happier, but also more productive. And I think that that really, things like that really show people that, oh, I'm not just a robot here thrown out on site to build a building. They listen to me. They want to know from me um, how the company can get better. So I really think it's all about authentic listening. What you're describing there, Alice Hannah, is a breath of fresh air. (laughs) And I am so excited to hear that you've got a, a whole organisation has this whole approach. I just think it's something that anybody listening to this can p- probably emulate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> one, Capital Capital Group is obviously one of the good good sto- good news stories on the uh, HR uh, front. So that's really wonderful. Alice, where to from here for you? What are your goals in the next twelve months? Uh, either working at Capital or for yourself personally. Well, look, there's still so much work to do at Capital. When we won Best Place to Work, we didn't say, great, finished, look at us, how good we are, not at all. It was absolutely jumping straight into the feedback from that survey to say, where can we get better? And also making sure we don't drop the ball and go backwards with all the good habits that we have. So Capital is growing really quickly, which, as you would know, presents cultural and leadership challenges. So the next year or so at Capital is evolving that culture as we grow incredibly quickly, which is really exciting for me as a HR practitioner to keep that fantastic small company vibe as we grow geographically and in size. So that's probably the next year for Capital and myself. And how many staff do you have at the moment? What about 160? 160 and it's 100% in Melbourne, Australia? At the moment, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, I don't know. I can ask if you've got expansion. (laughs) Potentially. Who knows? Who knows? (laughs) (laughs) Look, um, this has been absolutely wonderful. It's a uh, speaking with you, Alice Hannah. It's it's obviously a case study, a case study uh, that is showing a, a success mentality, a success mindset, and everybody in the organisation is obviously benefiting. So I, I wish Capital Group and yourself a wonderful future, which is obviously the trajectory that you're on. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Nina. My pleasure. My pleasure. Nina Sunday is on a mission, helping leaders transform culture. 
Nina travels from Brisbane, Australia for in-person presentations Australia-wide. Certified virtual presenter, Nina Sunday presents virtually, globally, for any time zone. To book Nina Sunday CSP to speak at your conference, visit ninasunday.com to request a proposal.